The um, the countdown actually began um, at about the eight hour mark, I guess, ahead of the launch with the official call to stations that occurred uh, a little bit before nine o'clock this morning, um, Eastern Time. The uh, at that point, the uh, three hour launch window was actually reduced down to two hours, and and then once the fueling started, the uh, the window was reduced from. Uh, two hours down to about 15 minutes and there's been some recent discussion about uh, uh, some of the uh, countdown in terms of the length of the launch window so we'll just wait and see how that all plays out as the uh, fueling continues on board. Yeah that's correct as we move through the count our launch window narrows and we're now looking at uh, essentially a 15 minute launch window that opens up at uh, 1700 Eastern Time uh, 5 o'clock p.m. Maybe while I have the chance, I can talk a little bit about the Antares launch vehicle itself. Antares is a two-stage launch vehicle which is designed to provide responsive, affordable, and reliable access to space for medium-class payloads. It's powered by two twin AJ-26 engines which produce a combined 74,000 pounds of sea level thrust. The booster is comprised of the RP-1 tank and liquid oxygen tank, which carry a total of 535,000 pounds of propellant. And then for this mission, the second stage utilizes a Castor 30 solid motor from Alliant Tech Systems, or ATK, which produces about 73,000 pounds of thrust. On the front end of the vehicle for this mission is a Cygnus mass simulator, which is protected by a new 3.9 meter diameter composite payload fairing. The Antares launch system uses many flight-proven heritage components from world-class suppliers as well as orbital-developed avionics and our own program management approaches and processes, which are common across our family of highly successful small-class Pegasus, Taurus, and Minotaur launch vehicles. The vehicle itself is just over 130 feet long, has a gross liftoff mass of about 620,000 pounds. The vehicle diameter is 12.8 uh, feet. Well, it's certainly, uh, in my view, a, a beautiful rocket. And uh, if we launch on time today, the uh, profile will actually have the vehicle uh, trajectory launching out, um, up, uh, of course, over the ocean and to the uh, southeast on a um, eventual inclination of about 51.6 degrees. So a little bit different than what people would think normally for a uh, flight to the International Space Station, but obviously this is a test flight. So you see there the, uh, the launch profile, and you see a, a region of potential um, ability to view as long as there's no clouds and a clear line of sight. Yeah, Kyle, there's been uh, numerous launches over the past 70-year uh, history of the Wallops Flight Facility, but this will be the biggest launch to date. And uh, because of that, it's likely that uh, others in the surrounding area will have a chance to see the mission. Um, the best chance to see the flight extends from about Cape May, New Jersey, southward through the outer banks of uh, North Carolina. I think I even heard mention that uh, there's been more than 16,000 launches from Wallops, and people probably don't realize, uh, you know, I bet you there's people that don't even realize there's a launch facility on the, you know, midway up the east coast of the U.S., but Wallops has got a very storied history. Um, now, this obviously is the biggest rocket that the Upper East Coast has ever seen. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, as you mentioned, there's been something like 16,000 launches. Most of them have been smaller suborbital vehicles, uh, still of significant importance to NASA and the country, but uh, nothing as large as uh, the Antares vehicle to date. So we may even attract more attention today in the area than the, uh, the pony penning uh, that typically happens in, uh, in the midsummer. <laughs> Well, we're going to try to, uh, we've got the uh, orbital countdown loop that's fed into NASA TV as well, and, and um, I believe uh, Adam Lewis is serving as the launch conductor, so we should hear quite a bit of conversation that includes him. Is that correct? That's correct. So if we look at the uh, voices, it 
that uh, you may be hearing today, as you mentioned, Adam Lewis is our launch conductor. Uh, the orbital mission director with Ultimate Flight Authority is uh, Frank, Frank Culberson, who is our VP of uh, Human Spaceflight Operations and uh, also a former astronaut. Uh, the Antares launch director for today is Kurt Eberly, the deputy program manager for the Antares program. The Cygnus launch director is uh, Frank DeMauro. Uh, NASA Wallops range is represented by Dave Helfrick. And the NASA Wallops uh, test director today is Sarah Doherty. Uh, Mars is represented on console by Sean Mulligan. Um, the uh, uh, ground safety officer for today is Tom Moskos. And um, the Antares uh, chief engineer for today and uh, for the duration of the program actually is Mike Dorsch. And uh, you'll be hearing his voice uh, after launch calling out the, uh, the MARC events. The Antares ground chief engineer is Tim Fackler. He's been instrumental in pulling together our, the uh, ground systems, working with Mars uh, on the extensive launch facility itself. Let's see, by the countdown clock, we're uh, just a little under 50 minutes from our opening of the uh, launch window. And at this point, obviously, we're still um, in the uh, fueling of the vehicle. There are several poles that take place throughout the countdown. Uh, the next one uh, should be coming up somewhere around 48 minutes or so after the hour, which is essentially a go for the uh, to proceed with the final countdown. And that would be in a, at about 12 minutes or so before launch. But of course, we did mention that the the weather. They are looking at the weather and the cloud cover. There are there are obviously uh, flight rules or launch rules, if you will, associated with uh, range and the weather, just like there is for any other rocket. Yeah, that's correct. Once again, even though this is a test launch, uh, and um, uh, we are still operating under the same uh, launch commit criteria as we would for a, a normal mission. Uh, cloud cover is uh, an element of that. So they'll be, I think, looking at the weather right up until uh, about the 30-minute mark. So, um, you know, another 20 minutes or so um, that they'll be watching the weather um, and determine um, if uh, the weather is not cooperative, it, where would be the best point in the countdown to uh, to uh, stop the launch and, and uh, target another date. Yeah, that's correct. Let's see, Steph. Um, the next one is the your. See, while we're uh, waiting for the latest on the countdown information relative to weather, John, let's. Um, I think you've got some uh, some nice footage of the of vehicle uh, being put together in the rollout, and we'll let you talk through some of that. Sure. Let's take a look at the elements of the launch vehicle and how they all uh, came together. Uh, the booster core was designed, tested, and manufactured in Nepopetrovsk, Ukraine by the state agencies Yuzhnoi and Yuzhmash. The booster cores are loaded into special design ships called Kondox, transported from the port of Oktobreski in the Ukraine to the port of Wilmington, Delaware. There, once at Wilmington, Delaware, the cores, which are 91 feet long and weigh 41,000 pounds, are transferred onto a special designed flatbed truck and transported by our subcontractor, Diamond Heavy Hall, about 150 miles to the Wallops Flight Facility. As you can see, this is a very well-coordinated activity. Uh, definitely with that uh, assistance there with the lines. 
there they are offloaded and placed on specialty handling equipment. This typically occurs in our horizontal integration facility. But here you see the offload in the H100 facility at Wallops as the HIF at this time was was not yet completed. One step 343 provides flight computer. The AJ-26 main engines are processed for us by Aerojet in their Sacramento facility. These high-performing engines were originally produced in Russia by the company now known as JSC Kuznetsov, where they were intended to be used on the Russian N-1 moon launch vehicles. Aerojet refurbishes and modifies these engines for us for their use on Antares. They're transported, as you see, to the NASA Stennis Space Center in Mississippi, where they're each independently hot-fire tested. Each of the engines are rated at 408,000 pounds of vacuum thrust, or 340,000 pounds of sea level thrust. We actually run them at 108% of this, producing almost 370,000 pounds of sea level thrust. The second stage, solid Castor 30 motor, is designed and built by ATK in Magna, Utah. It's derived from the highly successful Castor 120 motor, which Orbital uses on our other Pegasus and Taurus XL launch vehicles. The Castor 30 motor to be used on the A1 mission today produces about 73,000 pounds of thrust. We intend to increase the performance of Antares by using uprated variants of the Castor 30 motor, including the Castor 30 XL, which was recently successfully hot fire tested. The Castor 30 motors are shipped from the ATK manufacturing facility to the horizontal integration facility at Wallops. The stages and components of the Antares launch vehicle are integrated in the NASA Horizontal Integration Facility. This facility provides for efficient vehicle processing and checkout, and as you can see here, can accommodate multiple flight sets of hardware. Here you see not only the test launch vehicle with the Cygnus mass simulator in the background there, but also the booster and second stage for our COTS demo vehicle, the next mission we will launch. Once integrated, the vehicle is transferred to our transporter, erector, launcher, or TEL. The TEL and the Antares vehicle are transported about a mile from the HIF to launch pad 08 on a pair of articulating crawlers. There you see the Cygnus uh, mass simulator that's on the payload today. And here you see the start of uh, the rollout operation that I was, I was describing. The rollout uh, for the vehicle actually took place a week ago Saturday, Kyle, and uh, took uh, pretty much a full day, uh, starting at uh, very early in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning. And what's the dis distance from it's there? About a, it's about a mile from the HIF to the uh, launch pad itself. That's a pretty slow process to... From there to the launch yeah, we pad. Take great of that, care. It also has to be hoisted vertically, which you'll see, I guess, at the end. Yeah, so once. Beautiful uh, day that day. Yeah, we were fortunate to have For uh, a lot an of excellent reasons. day. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, once at the pad, the TEL engages with uh, in ground hydraulics, which serve to erect and lift the vehicle onto the launch stand. This is a very slow process. This was accelerated for the video, and uh, it's slow to minimize the loads on the spacecraft itself. The TEL, as you can see in this f shot now, live on stand, also provides accommodations for environmental control and electrical connections through liftoff. Uh, we successfully conducted an on-stand hot fire test of the booster back in February and a mission wet dress rehearsal was conducted last Saturday to again check out the vehicle and loading systems. And LCO LA on countdown one. Stand by LA. As I mentioned um, at the opening, um, there's a great deal of interest obviously in uh, um, this flight for a lot of reasons. It, it uh, will hopefully set the stage for the, the next flight uh, which will carry a uh, Cygnus payload that that uh, John mentioned 
um, to the International Space Station as a demonstration flight. Um, the uh, 